Okay, welcome back everyone. In this video we're going to talk about the EKG components. So now we're actually going to start getting to the meat of the matter. So we're going to look at all the pieces that make up the EKG, EKG components. Alright, so let's just lay them out there. Alright, so there are big components you need to know. The P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave. Now you need to know what each of these things do, and we'll, we'll talk about them in great detail here in just a few minutes. All right, so the first thing you need to know, let's look at the P wave in depth. All right, so we're going to explore the P wave and all the things it can tell us. So the P wave is the electrical manifestation of atrial depolarization. Atrial depolarization. So when the atria depolarize, they release electricity, and that electricity gets picked up on the EKG and it's going to have a very specific shape and it's going to show up in a specific place and we're going to call that atrial depolarization. So let's look at some of the characteristics. All right, so some of the characteristics of a P wave include a nice upright rounded shape. So in lead 2, everything we do in lead is in lead 2 for now, we'll add additional leads later, but in lead 2 characteristics are upright and rounded. So there can be some variations here, all right, but some some generally speaking it's going to be an upright and rounded shape. It should be less than 2.5 millimeters tall. And the duration of it, so that's this guy here, it should be less than two and a half millimeters. And then its duration should last less than 110 milliseconds. Essentially, that's three of those little boxes. So it should be about somewhere between two and a half and three millimeters. So it shouldn't be any more than two and a half millimeters tall, shouldn't be any more than, uh, than 110 milliseconds in duration, and its shape should be upright and rounded. The other thing is that it should precede QRS complexes. And it will for these first few rhythms that we talk about. So the, a, the P wave represents atrial depolarization. It's an upright and rounded shape that's not too tall, not too long, and it should show up before the QRS complex. All right, so this you have to know. There's no way around it. What you also need to know is that the P wave is formed not just by atrial depolarization, but by depolarization that's created in the SA node. So when the SA node fires and it causes atrial depolarization, it forms a P wave on the EKG. All right, so let's take a look at some other things that can happen on the EKG. For example, let's look at P wave morphology, shape, variances. All right, so let's take a look at what can happen here. So sometimes the P wave can look like this. It can have two humps, and it cannot be rounded like we normally expect it to be. And we're going to talk about why that is. And you'll see also that this first hump is a little bit less tall than this hump here, and that's done on purpose. So as you recall, there are two atria. And the right atrium fires first, and the reason for that is because the SA node is there. And eventually, it goes by way of Bachmann's bundle, part of the conduction system, over to the left atrium. Now, what would happen to the shape of the P wave if Bachmann's bundle is either longer than it should be or if there is a delay in Bachmann's bundle because that tissue is ischemic, meaning that it doesn't have enough oxygen? Well, the answer is that it would take longer for the depolarization wave in the right atrium that was created by the SA node to make its way over to the left atrium. And as you know, if we look at time on the EKG, it's on the x-axis, this is time. And if we have a delay that takes place here, we represent that by elongating the interval that we're looking at. So in this case, when a P has an M shape, and it's of long duration, meaning that it's greater than 110 milliseconds, we call this P mitral. And this refers to mitral valve. 
So when you have a mitral valve problem that causes the left atrium to enlarge, one of the things you can see on the EKG is this M-shaped P wave that lasts longer, and it's got this characteristic shape. Again, this is this little hump that's a result of the right atrial depolarization taking place. Then there's this little pause that takes place because it's got a delay in Bachman's bundle. And then the second hump is a result of the left atrium depolarizing. Now, if you want to look at this graphically, what's really happening here is the right atrium is doing this. And it's depolarizing. And then the left atrium is doing this, depolarizing a little bit later. And so there is an event that takes place here. In fact, there's overlap of two things here. But remember that the EKG simply can't do anything other than add electrical information. So it can't look at just the right atrium in isolation and then just the left atrium in isolation. So it looks at both. And the result of this shape, of this blending of the right and left atrial depolarization with delay is this little hump that takes place. All right, you'll also note that if you look at the literature here, that at the peak of this hump and the peak of this hump, these peaks need to be separated by more than 40 milliseconds in order for you to call this p-metral. We'll talk a ton more about this. I just wanted you to see one shape that was possible. All right, the next shape that I want you to see that we can see with the P-wave is called p pulmonal, And this refers to the pulmonary system. So this is a right-sided heart problem. All right, so what does P-palmonal looks like? P-palmonal kind of looks like this. So it's got this TP shape or this tented shape. It's got a peaked appearance or an A shape. Looks like a letter A. It is usually of normal duration. <clears throat> the variance here is that it is tall. So this P wave is going to have an amplitude greater than 2.5 millimeters tall. So P-palmonal tells you about right heart problems and right heart problems are always almost due to pulmonary problems so it could be a valve problem it could be pulmonary hypertension it could be the right AV valve that's causing problems in any case P pulmonal looks like this it's this A shape and it's tall alright so P wave in summary P wave is the electrocardiographic manifestation of SA node depolarization. The P wave is supposed to be upright and rounded. It's supposed to be less than two and a half millimeters tall and less than 110 milliseconds long, and it should precede each QRS complex. Sometimes the P wave shape can change based on problems such as systemic hypertension or mitral valve pro, uh, problems and in those cases, we get something called p mitral, which is the M-shaped P wave. If we have a pulmonary disease or a pulmonary problem or a right AV valve problem, we can get a P pulmonal on the EKG, which is manifested by a very tall and peaked appearing P wave. All right, next, we got to look at the QRS complexes. So the QRS complex is a grouping of three waves, a Q wave, an R wave, and an S wave. It is a result of ventricular depolarization. When ventricular depolarization takes place, you get a QRS complex. Now let's look at each individual wave. So this is a QRS complex. Now, I want to point out to you that there's this thing called an isoelectric line. And the isoelectric line is a neutral point, isoelectric. You'll also see it as baseline. Baseline means the same thing. You'll see it as isomeric line. These things all mean the same thing. They're referring to the zero point on the EKG. So everything that's below this line is said to be a negative deflection. Everything that rests above deflection, sorry about that. Everything that rests above this line is a positive deflection. All right, so what do you need to know here? 
the very first thing that happens after a P wave, if it's a negative deflection, meaning that it goes below isoelectric, is called a Q wave. The Q wave represents the depolarization of the interventricular septum. If the first wave or the first wave that exists above isoelectric following a P wave, when it is positive is said to be the R wave. The R wave is a result of the left ventricle depolarizing. Last but not least, any wave that exists after the R wave that is negative, meaning it falls back below isoelectric, is called the S wave. The S wave is the final stage of depolarization of the ventricles. So the first depolarization that takes place following a P wave, if it's negative, is said to be a Q wave. The first positive deflection following a P wave is called an R wave. And anything following the R wave that's negative deflection is said to be an S wave. So let's take a look at these a little bit more closely because there are some different possibilities here. We can of course have this guy. We can also have this. 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 We can have this. All right, so let's take a look at some of these different possibilities here. So if we look at here, we're going to take a look and say, all right, I'm going to assume that there's a P wave before each of these just to eliminate some of the drawings. So the first thing we want to do is say, all right, what's the first wave deflected here? Well, it's this guy here. So is it negative or, it's posi or is it positive? It's negative. First negative deflection in this complex is called a Q wave. Next, we have a positive deflection. This is called the R. And last but not least, it returns to negative again, S. Now you'll notice that I'm using uppercase and lowercase, and the reason for that is to identify or to establish a relationship that exists. So if you put a lowercase letter, it means it's a small wave compared to a uppercase letter. So let's take a look at the next one. Maybe you'll see it better. First deflection here is negative. So I'm going to put a Q. First deflection following this is a positive wave. It's going to be an R. So little Q, lowercase Q. Tall R wave, big capital case R. So there's no S wave in this guy. We still call it a QRS complex, but it's actually a QR complex because there's no S wave. There's nothing negative following this R wave. All right, let's take a look at this guy. We get to this first deflection. There is no negative. First deflection is positive. R. There is a negative wave that follows that. We're going to put a little s because it's smaller than the R wave. So this is an RS complex. Now, you get to this guy here, and now the rules change a little bit. So you're going to show up, and boom, it's negative. So you want to call this a Q wave. But you're only partially correct because you can't just have a Q wave on the EKG. It's got to return to the baseline, so we call this a QS complex. QX complex is always a sign of pathology. Always. Always, always. This is never normal. QS complexes are always an abnormal finding on the EKG. We'll talk a lot more about that. All right, let's take a look at this guy here. Well, we get to this first deflection. It's positive all the way up until here, so we have an R. Then it goes below isoelectric, so we have an S, which is smaller than the R, so it's a little S. And then we have another positive deflection. Well, we know positive deflections are R waves, so we're going to call this RSR. Now, when you have more than one letter, meaning if you have two R's, we're going to call the second one prime by putting a little hashtag there. So this is an RSR prime complex. All right, let's take a look at this. Again, we show up here, and we have this first complex. It's a positive complex, so we're going to call it an R wave. And it never goes back below isoelectric, yet there's this additional piece that shows up, which is a second wave, all the way back down to here. And here we're going to call this an R, R prime. So this is the first R wave. 
This is the second R wave, and R, R prime complex is what we're going to call this. Now, just as I showed you with the atria that we're depolarizing, there are actually two events taking place here. So there's this first event, which is actually one of the ventricles, and because there's a delay in depolarizing one of the ventricles, there's going to be this additional event that takes place, and that's depolarization of this second ventricle that's taking place here. And since both can't be represented at the exact same time, meaning you can't see, I'm sorry, since both have to be represented at the exact same time, and you can't see just one ventricle depolarizing in isolation of the other, instead of showing you one and then the other, it puts them both, to, both together, and that's why you get this weird pattern that takes place. All right, so then the next one that shows up here is kind of difficult. We're going to look at this. We're going to have a negative deflection that takes place here. This is going to be our Q wave. And then last but not least, it goes back up. Even though there's a second Q, we don't say Q, Q prime. We're just going to call this a QS complex as well. All right, so you'll see there are a lot of different ways that the QRS complex can look. And we're going to, we, we just kind of generically call everything a QRS complex, but really we should call them what it is because in a little while we're going to establish some rules. For example, when we see an RSR pattern, that's going to be indicative of bundle branch block. When we see a QS pattern, we're going to call that pathology for ischemia. So QRS complex is kind of like the vague way of describing it, but the reality is the QRS complex actually should be described exactly the way you see it. For example, if you see an RS complex, we should call it an RS complex. If you see QR, you should call it QR and so on and so forth. All right, the next thing we got to do is we got to talk about the T wave. So let's talk about, lastly, the T wave. All right, so the T wave. All right, the T wave should be this, I'm going to draw a QRS complex here only so that you have a reference point. T wave should be this nice gradual upslope wave that follows the QRS complex that rapidly returns to baseline. So the T wave stops at the end of the QRS complex, I'm sorry, it begins at the very, be at the very end of the QRS complex and it ends where it returns to baseline. So this is the T wave here. It's this guy that's here. So the T wave again in lead two should be upright. It should be a gradual upslope with a rapid return to baseline. Rapid return to baseline. So there's no precise measurement of how long or how tall this should be, but in general, it should not exceed half the overall height of the QRS complex. So a T wave amplitude should be less than half the QRS amplitude. And when it exceeds that, it's because there's disease. So we're going to talk a lot about the diseases that cause T waves to get real tall or real ugly looking. All right, so essentially we've covered the P, QRS, and T waves. I'm not going to talk about the U wave right now, but if you see it in the literature, there is something that follows the T wave, and it can sometimes show up in some of the EKGs. It'll just be this little wave. It won't be quite that uh, obvious, but it's a U wave, and we'll talk more about that. We'll see it in hyper hypothermia. We'll see it in uh, hypokalemia. We'll see it a little bit later, and we'll mention it when it shows up there. But for now, all I want you to know is what the normal T wave looks like, and don't worry so much about what the U wave looks like. All right, so let's take a look at an actual tracing. All right, so let, this is how we're going to start with this tracing. We're going to look for all of the components. We're not interpreting this tracing yet. We'll do that in a different video. First thing I want you to appreciate is that we're always going to look for the QRS complex first because that's the biggest thing that should stand out on the EKG. That serves as a reference point for us. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to look just before the QRS complex, and we're going to find the P wave. And the P wave is this guy right here. It's this guy right here. It's nice and upright, and it's rounded. You'll see there's a little bit of a notch in there, but it's certainly not a big M notch. Like, it's not a P me trial, because P me trial would look something like this. Right? It'll be huge, and it'll be this, this big difference that exists between these notches. And that's not the case here. So this is a normal-looking P wave. This P wave is definitely less than 2.5 millimeters tall. It's definitely less than 110 milliseconds long, and it's nice, and it's upright, and it's rounded, and it precedes the QRS complex. So this must be a P wave. All right, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look for the next component, and that's where exactly where this starts and exactly where this ends right here. This is called the QRS complex. Now, you'll notice there's a little bit of a deflection downwards first, and then the QRS goes up, and then it comes back down, 
and then it comes back up. So actually we do have a little bit of a Q wave here. That's normal. We have a good solid R wave. That's this tall guy right here. And then right where isoelectric is again, we have a little bit that's below. We're going to call that an S. So this is in fact a QRS complex just like we want to see it in lead two. It's an upright complex. We knew that from the previous video that it should be. We have a Q wave, an R wave, and an S wave. This is our good looking QRS complex. Now, next thing you'll notice here is this nice gradual upslope and rapid return to baseline. So the T wave follows the QRS complex. It starts right where the QRS complex ends and where it returns to baseline. This here is our T wave. So T wave follows the QRS. It's upright also. It's nice and gradual upslope, rapid return to baseline, and this represents ventricular repolarization. So we're going to take a look at where all these components start and stop in just a second, but I want you to appreciate that there are a couple things of importance here. The QRS complex and the T wave should always point in the same direction. So I mean by that, that if you look at a QRS complex, if it is predominantly upright, the T wave should also be predominantly upright. In other words, we don't want to have a QRS complex that looks like this, followed by a T wave that looks like that. So this pattern where the QRS and the T point in the same direction is called QRS and T wave concordance. They concur with one another. This is what we want. This makes you happy. This is exactly what you want to see. When, however, the QRS and the T wave do not point in the same direction, this is called a pattern of QRS and T wave discordance. Discordance. And this makes you sad because this means, whoops, this means that there is disease taking place here. So a little guy here frowny face because this is unhappiness, right? When the QRS and the T wave point in opposite direction, this is called a pattern of discordance and that's not acceptable. That means there's disease here. So we always want to look for that. We're going to talk about the approach to interpretation, but this was a nice EKG for us to introduce that concept. All right. So in addition to the, to the, in addition to the components of P, QRS, and T waves, now we're going to look at some additional stuff called the EKG intervals. And the intervals that are important to you are going to be the PR interval, the QRS duration, and the QT interval. All right, so let's take a look at the first one, which is the PR interval. The PR interval, also written as PRI, you'll see that mostly, starts at the beginning of the P wave. So this is our isoelectric line. We always find our isoelectric line. And any time it starts to depart from the isoelectric line, we're going to just kind of put a little marker there. Now, we're going to follow this P wave all the way out, and then we're going to follow this next little guy here until it gets to the QRS complex. And you'll see there's a little Q wave here. So here's our isoelectric again. And then we get this little guy that departs from isoelectric. So just before that, so like right about here, that's where the QRS complex begins. That's where the PR interval stops. So PR interval should be no greater than 200 milliseconds. That's five small boxes. So one of the things we're going to do on every EKG is we're going to count the number of small boxes that exist from the start of the P wave to the end of the PR segment. Now, yes, I said segment. I'm going to show you that in a second. And from the beginning of the P wave to the end of the PR segment is something called the PR interval. The PR interval represents the sum of atrial depolarization and the delay of the signal at the level of the AV node. So remember, SA nodes up here, AV nodes down here, ventricles are down here. SA node fires, you get a P wave. And that P wave represents the amount of time and the depolarization that takes place inside the atria. Well, as we know, in order for the ventricles to completely fill, we got to give them a little time to do so after the atria have contracted. So we get depolarization of the SA node, we get a P wave on the EKG, then the AV node acts as the gatekeeper between the atria and the ventricles 
to delay the signal that was created at the level of the SA node from getting to the ventricles until they're completely full. That delay that takes place at the level of the AV node is known as the PR segment on the EKG. So, atrial depolarization, P wave. PR segment is this flat guy right here. And this flat guy right here represents the delay of time, the delay of conduction from SA node to getting to the ventricles to allow the ventricles to completely fill with blood. The PR interval reflects atrial depolarization and that delay of the AV node, meaning the PR segment, as a one complete number PR interval of less than 200 milliseconds. So the PR interval is the P wave plus the PR segment, which is the little guy after the P wave right before the QRS complex. And in its entirety, this is the PR interval. All right, so this guy here is the PR interval, this distance that exists. And it should be less than 200 milliseconds. If it's longer than that, it means that there's either a delay in the P wave itself or that there's a delay in the level of the AV node. And we're gonna be able to see that on the EKG. So when we have heart block in the AV node, meaning that the AV node is sick, then the PR segment is going to get really, really, really long. So we'll be able to see that change on the EKG. All right. The next one we got to talk about is the QRS duration. So QRS duration is immediately following the PR segment, meaning that P wave follow the PR segment until it deflects again. So right about here, and we get a little Q wave right here, and then a big R wave, then we get a little S wave right here, and right at this point here, right at this point here, is where we have the end of the QRS complex. So this is the QRS complex, and the QRS complex duration ranges from 40 milliseconds on the low end, you'll sometimes see it as 80 milliseconds, but in any case, the top number must be less than 120 milliseconds. So it can be 40 to 120, or it can be 80 to 120. I don't care which numbers you use, so long as you remember that the normal duration cannot exceed 120 milliseconds. It doesn't matter if you call it 40 or 80 on the bottom end, because even the experts don't agree on, on what it is. All right, so 40 to 80 milliseconds, all the way up to 120, that's the normal duration of the QRS complex. All right, so we've looked at the PR interval and we said it should be less than 200 milliseconds. We looked at the QRS, we said it needs to be less than 120 milliseconds. Now the last thing we're gonna do is look at this last interval and this last interval is called the QT interval. And although we won't do much with it for now and we're certainly not gonna look at it when we're just learning how to do the dysrhythmias, I need you to know what it is in about a week from now. So we're just gonna cover it now. So the QT interval is the entire duration from the beginning of the QRS complex, even if there's no Q wave. So remember, sometimes we have QRS complexes, they look like this, where we have an RS complex. There's no Q wave here. We would still start our measurement from the very beginning of that QRS complex. And it's gonna go all the way through to the end of the T wave. So in this particular case, we're going to find isoelectric, always started isoelectric. We're going to follow our little P wave, our PR segment. And then right at the end of this PR segment, there's a little negative deflection that happens right about where I've marked. And on the other end of that, we're going to follow Q, R, S. This is our S, T segment. We'll talk about that in a second. And then our T wave that, he, that follows here. And right at the end of this T wave, right where it returns to isoelectric, this amount of time that happens is called the QT interval. Now, the QT interval is age and gender specific in terms of its duration. So for now, I'm not gonna give you a, an exact number. What I want you to appreciate is we're gonna come back to this later and we're gonna review what this means and we're gonna see what happens when it elongates or when it shortens but I want you to appreciate that the QT interval is gonna be different for every age group and whether male or female, they're gonna get a different duration of what's acceptable. So QRS complex or a PR interval we say is less than 200 milliseconds doesn't really matter. If it's more than 200, it's abnormal. Well, duration of the QT interval might be normal at 410 milliseconds for somebody. It might be normal at 380 milliseconds for somebody. 
It might be normal at 440 milliseconds for somebody. It just depends because it is age and gender specific. So we'll come back to that in a little bit. All right, QT interval, beginning of the QRS complex all the way through to the end of the T wave. And the QT interval represents one complete ventricular cycle, meaning that this tells us about the duration that it took for the ventricles to depolarize and for the ventricles to repolarize. One complete ventricular cardiac cycle, QT interval. So we'll see what the importance of that is here in, uh, in just a week or so. All right, last but not least, we got to look at one more interval that's sometimes very difficult to see and sometimes difficult to, to outline, but we're going we're gonna to do so in a couple weeks with, uh, with some little tricks. I just happen to use this tracing because this tracing is very neat and it allows you to see the, the ST segment very, very easily. So ST segment is the segment on the EKG following the QRS complex, so it's after the QRS, but before the T wave. And this isn't always so obvious, and you won't see it quite as obvious as you're going to see on this EKG in just a second. So sometimes the ST segment, we're going to assume that it's there, and we're going to decide that it's there or prove that it's there based on the shape that we see in the T wave itself. All right, so let's, let's take a look here. So this is a QRS complex. Here's a big, tall R wave, this little S wave that follows here. And right at the end of this S wave, there is this point in time where it returns to isoelectric. And right at this end of isoelectric line, right before it starts to go up, right about here, this little section here is very isoelectric. It's on this line, this isoelectric line that takes place. This is the ST segment. So this here. ST segment. This here, ST segment. Then we have the T wave that follows it. All right, so the ST segment is after the QRS complex, before the T wave, and it represents early stages of ventricular repolarization. So as we know, the T wave is ventricular repol, but the early stages of ventricular repolarization take place here in the ST segment. All right, so having had all of that newfound knowledge now, we're going to add one more point to this, and that is it's not a wave, it's not a segment, but it's a point, and we're going to call this thing the J point. And the J point represents the end of the QRS and the beginning of the ST or T wave, the ST segment or T wave. And the J point, in essence, is where we've put these green lines to identify where the beginning of this ST segment actually is. So it's actually going to be kind of right here and right here. All right, so ST segment is this flattened part right after the QRS complex, and right at the beginning of that ST segment, we're going to call that thing a J point. The J point stands for the junction, the junction between ventricular dipole and ventricular repole. So repolarization of the ventricles begins at this exact point in time called the J point. And the J point also signifies the end of ventricular depolarization. So we're going to look a lot at, uh, at the J point here in a few weeks when we look at changes that occur to the ischemic myocardium because the J point is actually the number one affected point when we have myocardial ischemia taking place. So we're going to come back and look at the location of this J point quite a bit. Now, a couple things while we're going to we're going to be getting into our green books here, our green practice books. I don't want you to worry about certain things on the EKG that you see. So, when we go to interpret the EKG, we're not going to worry about things like the QT interval and the J point as we're starting out. We're just going to look at the very very basics. We're going to look at the P, the QRS, the T wave, we're going to look at the PR interval, and that's pretty much it. All right, for now, we're going to look at other things later, but we're not going to mess with the J point or the QT. That'll come at a later point. All right, so what we've done in this video is we've talked a little bit about the components of the EKG to include the waves, P wave, QRS complex, and T waves. And we also mentioned the intervals, PR interval, and the QT interval. We talked about two segments. The segments were the PR segment, and we talked about the ST segment, 
And last but not least, we talked about the location of the J point. So we'll be looking at all those in the weeks ahead. Stay tuned.